Ave Maria. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Saint Mark tells us that after John had been arrested, Jesus went into Galilee. And there he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Two things our Lord tells us. One is that we should repent. And the second is we should believe the good news. What does he mean when we said we should repent? What is repentance? In essence, repentance is sorrow for sins committed with a resolution not to commit them again. And I'm sure that you're all aware that it is very difficult to repent of our sins. We tend to be sorry for our sins if we have been injured by them, if we've been caught because of them. But to be sorry for them is an entirely different story. Because the reason for our sorrow, in the words of our Lord, should be because we have offended God who has loved us. Not so much because we will be punished for the sin, but from the fact that we are sorry we have injured the God who loved us. So much so that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, as we heard in the letter, the first letter of St. Peter. Christ himself, innocent though he was, died once for sins, died for the guilty to lead us to God. So this, in fact, should be the reason for our sorrow and for our repentance that we have not, we have been ungrateful towards God, our Creator, who has loved us. The second thing is, believe the good news. Well, what is the good news? If we don't know what the good news is, how can we believe it? Well, the good news is that Christ died for our sins so that we need not be punished for our sins, provided that we are repentant. But also, with this, with the believing of the good news, are all the other things that he taught us, the things which are contained in the constant teaching of the church, the authentic teaching of the church. Which church? The one he founded, the Catholic Church. And these days it's necessary to add the adjective authentic teaching of the church. St. Mark's account of our Lord's temptation is very short. St. Mark doesn't tell us what the temptations were. St. Matthew and St. Luke tell us in some detail, what the temptations were. St. John doesn't even mention our Lord was tempted. And so the three temptations represent the three enemies of our souls. Essentially, the temptations are that of pride, of avarice, lust, of gluttony, sins of the flesh. And these are things that we need to guard against. But since St. Mark, the least the church has, has given us St. Mark as our gospel for today, we need to go back and to consider the nature of sin. Christ himself, innocent though he was, died once for sins. And so what is sin? In essence, sin is a rebellion against God. It is, in fact, to disobey God. 
And we can do this in a number of ways. In the case of Adam, our first father, God gave him a commandment, a single commandment, to not eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. But God wasn't content to just give the commandment. He also gave a warning or a reason why it should not be eaten. The day you eat of it, you will die the death. And so death was the ultimate punishment for disobedience. Now in the Hebrew, it actually says you will, you will die, die the death. Indicating there are two kinds of death. The two deaths are the death of the body, which we all know about and which we experience, and the death of the soul, which we also know about, though it is less in our consciousness. So Adam broke God's commandments, and as a consequence, he was expelled from the garden. He lost all the gifts God had given him. Namely, or most importantly, he lost, first of all, the gift of integrity. That is where his will, his, set, his intellect, is subject to his reason. And we all know what that means. When we sin, we know it's unreasonable for us to do it, but nonetheless we do it. His will, his body rebelled against his will. He could no longer do the good that he knew. St. Paul laments it. The good I know I should do, I don't do. The evil I know I shouldn't do is the very thing that I do. His senses rebelled against his body. He was driven by the senses. We are driven by the senses. And so we find ourselves increasingly in this turmoil of sin. Now, there are, the, the first of all, Adam's sin was a sin of human nature. And it is personal to Adam, but consequential to us, consequential in the sense that we inherit it. We call it original sin because it is the sin from which all other sins emerge. And original sin is not because we inherit it. It's not something, but rather it's a lack of something. When God created Adam, he created him in a state of grace, of friendship. When Adam sinned, he lost that state of grace, of friendship with God. We, the children of Adam, were born without that grace, friendship with God. And this condition in which we're born, we call the original sin. So you see, it's not something, but rather a lack of, of something. Something is missing, God's grace. This, because of Christ, has been restored to us in baptism. So, sin then is something that we live with. Now, in the broadest possible terms, there are two kinds of sins. There is what is called personal sin. That is a sin you and I commit. We deliberately choose against God's law. But there's also the world of sin in which we live. And we get an inkling of this in Genesis. Today we have the reading from Genesis where we heard about Noah. We also had the reading from the first letter of St. Peter, the third chapter, where again we heard about Noah. And so it's appropriate then for us to consider Noah. Noah was the eighth patriarch from Adam. As you go down the genealogy, we find Noah there, the eighth. Is that important? Well, yes, it's important in as much as eight represents the number of redemption. 
Christ rose on the eighth day, or the first day of the week. Now, let us look at this situation. We have Noah, and just in, that's in the sixth chapter of seventh, seventh chapter of Genesis. In the sixth chapter, we read about the sons of God and the sons of men. We're told that the sons of God looked upon the daughters of the sons of men and that they married them. And then we're told that the whole world became corrupted. So much so that God repented. He regretted that he had made man and resolved to destroy everything. The flood came. What was Noah doing? Noah was instructed by God to build the ark. And we heard St. Peter tell us exactly this. Now it was long ago when Noah was still building the ark in which only a small group of eight were saved by water and when God was still waiting patiently that these spirits refused to believe. Okay, so Noah was building the ark. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? It took him 100 years. And during that time, he was preaching. He was warning his fellow citizens about the anger of God that was increasing day by day because of their sins. They laughed at him. Why did they laugh at him? Because he was building the ark in the middle of the land. There was no sea about. And so they thought him a madman. But he built steadily. And then what happened? We're told that God gave Noah the commandment to allow the animals to come in. And the animals appeared and they entered the ark. Just as God, we read in Genesis in the second chapter, God called the animals for Adam to name them. And the animals came one by one to be named by Adam. So also the animals came two by two to enter the ark. When they were all in, God shut the doors of the ark. Not Noah, God did it. And so it started to rain. What happened? Well, the people who were laughing at Noah saw it was raining and they didn't bother initially. But when we're told in scripture, God opened the floodgates of heaven and the floodgates of the fountains in the earth and the water was rising and falling, they started to feel differently about it. And some scrambled to the top of their houses, others climbed hills, others still climbed mountains. But it wasn't any use. We're told that the waters covered the mountains 15 cubits. So they were all drowned. However, consider this. They saw death approaching. And they re some repented. They suddenly felt that their end was near. They became aware of their sins. We had something like that happen at Fatima on the 13th of October, 1917 when the crowd there of 70,000 saw the sun dancing in the sky and then plunged towards the earth, we're told 70,000 people were told that people started to confess their sins because they thought the world was about to end. So we can assume the same thing would happen in the time of Noah. The waters were rising and they saw 
that their world was about to end. And so some confessed their sins, and God would have forgiven them. We notice also at that time, idolatry was not one of the sins that they were guilty of. They all believed in God. And so in their case, it was easy because they would appeal to the true God. And so we're told only eight were saved while God was waiting patiently for the spirits who refused belief. Now let's consider this. There were some who repented and there would be others, no doubt, who would not repent. But those who refused to repent would have gone to hell instantly. But those who repented, their sins would have been forgiven, but the punishment due to their sins would remain. And it is these who ended up in what St. Peter calls the prison. He went to preach to the spirits in prison. We call it today, because we have the fullness of truth, limbo, or the place of the fathers, or, as our Lord called it, Abraham's bosom, or, as is called by the good, on, on, on the cross on Calvary, paradise. Not heaven. And so it is this waiting place, limbo, that our Lord went to preach. Not to preach, repent, because they had already done so, but rather to declare that heaven was open. That's what he went to do there. And we read in St. Matthew's Gospel that when the Lord rose, the bodies of the dead also rose and were seen to go into the holy city. It says so in Matthew 28. So then our Lord went and he preached to those who were detained there. So that would include, of course, Adam and Eve. It would include the um, patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It would include all of those who up to the time of our Lord had already died. When our Lord went and preached, heaven was open and they could go into heaven. So we now have a new condition, a new state. We, limbo is now closed. But we have heaven, to which we are called, hell, to which we will fall into if we do not repent, and we have purgatory, which in a sense replaces limbo, replaces this prison that our Lord went to preach. And in purgatory, the souls of the just, because they have repented of their sins, but the punishment remains, the souls of the just are detained there, being purified, purged of the punishment due to their sins. And we as Catholics have an obligation to pray for the souls in purgatory. Now let us consider something else, an important question. What was it that God, that made God so angry, he repented that he had recreate, created the human race? What was it? We get a glimmer of it in several places in scripture. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, our Lord said, when the Son of Man comes, said it will be as in Noah's day. People were eating and drinking, marrying and being married, And the flood came and swept them all away. It will be, he says, as in the day of Lot. People were eating and drinking, marrying, 
buying and selling until the day Lot left Sodom and fire and brimstone fell from heaven. Now in the case of Noah, we are told that when the flood was over, Noah came out of the ark and God put the rainbow in the sky and he said, see, I establish my covenant with you and with all your descendants after you, also with every living creature to be found with you, birds, cattle, and every wild beast with you, everything that came out of the ark, everything that lives on earth. I establish my covenant with you. No thing of flesh shall be swept away again by the waters of the flood. There shall be no flood to destroy the earth again. God said, listen please, God said, Here is the sign of the covenant I make between myself and you and every living creature for all generations. I set my bow in the clouds, it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So God placed the rainbow in the clouds as a sign of his covenant. Okay, so far? Why did God do this? The rainbow actually is a very interesting phenomenon. First of all, it's a circle. We don't see all of it. It's an arc. And it's broken up into seven colors. So we start with red at the top. If I remember, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So we have the colors of the spectrum. And every time we look at it, we remember God's kindness, God's mercy towards us. But I come back to the question, what was it that made God repent of creating the human race? And the answer to that, we have to go back to the Jewish interpretation of Genesis. It's called the Midrash. And in chapter 26, we are told why God was angry. Our Lord said that when he comes, it will be as in the time of Noah, eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage. It's the same as the time of Lot. They were eating and drinking, marrying, buying and selling. Now these things are natural and we all do them. But hidden in there, and the Midrash tells us, was an abuse of those things. Now, before I go on, I want to make myself very clear. There is our personal sin for which we individually are responsible. But there is also a social sin for which we are not directly responsible. Or, as we read, there is the sin of the sons of men, which is in total opposition to the sons of God. So what was it? What sin of the sons of men was so terrible that God had to clean the earth, wash it clean? And the answer is, it was a sin against nature. On natural sin. Because again, reading the Midrash, we read, Men married men. Women married women. There's a difference between those who have, for whatever reason, a weakness. 
a weakness towards unnatural sin. That is quite personal, and God in his mercy will deal with that. But when the society chooses to make those things legal, it's an entirely different story. Because it's a society, the sons of men, who defy God. And that is what happened. Because the people of Noah's time were saying, we can decide our own laws. We don't need the natural law. And of course, Sodom is classical. We read, St. Peter tells us about Sodom. St. Jude tells us about Sodom. He calls it unnatural lust. St. Paul tells us about Sodom. Ezekiel tells us about Sodom. Jeremiah tells us about Sodom. Do I need to go on? It's clear in the scriptures. Moses spoke about it. We pray and we support our brothers and sisters who, because of some weakness, are inclined towards those sins. But when the state, when the government mandates it, there's going to be a problem. And we have seen what happens. First of all, we have these groups, LGBT, etc. They are asking, well, we have rights. All human beings have rights. All human beings have the same rights. We want to marry. Well, everybody has the right to marry. But you marry someone of the opposite gender, opposite sex. That makes everybody equal, surely. But no, they say, well, we are a special case and we are like the African Americans, the blacks. We've been persecuted because of our inclinations. That's not an argument. But it's used and used very effectively as well. And so they were granted the right of recognition. So homosexual relationships were recognized. They weren't marriages, they were just unions. And after a few years, they demanded it to become marriage, didn't they? And it became marriage. Were they content with that? No. They wanted now to be recognized by everyone. So if someone, if a, a caterer, and there are many cases, a caterer says, I cannot make a cake for your homosexual marriage because I'm a Christian and it's a violation of my conscience, what do they do? They, what do they do? They take the person to court. And the court rules against the caterer. And the caterer, if they're lucky, will only lose their business. If not, they'll go to jail. Isn't that what we're seeing? And so what has happened is this right, this claim to a right is being imposed. And you're being forced to accept it whether you like it or not. And it's so bad, they're not content with this. They're going after the children. And we have books promoting this lifestyle in our schools right here in St. Lucia. Our children have been corrupted. Innocent children who know nothing of these things. And what are we doing? We're not making a fuss. We're keeping quiet. What for? We're going to be as guilty as the people who are promoting it. Because silence means consent. And if we keep silent, we are consenting to what is being done. There is a school, a Jewish school in London. I should say there was. 
it was a private school. That meant the parents paid for the education of their children. The children were from four years to 10 years. Four years to 10 years. The Department of Education said to the school, you have to teach transgenderism to these children. The school said no. The department said you have to teach transgenderism and all the other things to the children, four to ten years old. The school said no. They closed down the school. And this is a private school. Because, of course, in the public school, it's being taught. Now, if we go on an uh, international level, if we go to the international level, we know that there has been a push to legalize these same-sex relationships in Africa. And the African nation said, no, God bless Africa. And so what did the U.S. and the EU do, threaten to do? We will not give you funding, we will not give you aid, until you do it. Why? Why is there this push to legitimize something even against the culture of other nations? Because it's the work of the children of men. And what are the children of God doing about it? We heard, and many of us, all of us, I hope, were scandalized last year when we heard about some new blessing. Blessing of unions, irregular unions, those who are living in adultery, those who are living in a state of fornication, those who are living in a state of same-sex unions, they can be blessed. Doesn't that tell you the power of the LGBT, etc. community? We've never heard of anything like that. When, as a priest, whoever comes to me for a blessing, I will bless them. I have no interest in what your situation is. And I'm sure when you've gone to a priest for a blessing, you've asked, bless me, Father. And that's it. You get the blessing. Regardless of what you've done, don't you get the blessing? Yes. Nobody's ever said, are you this or are you that or anything else? You just said you have a blessing. But suddenly we have couples coming up. Now if a couple comes up, they come up as what? A couple. And therefore the blessing is for the couple. And if you approve the blessing of a couple, it means you approve what they are doing. You see how cunning Satan is? And so the attack on the church is increasing in intensity at the highest levels of the church. Paul VI, he was Pope from 1963, 62 to 78. He said on two occasions, the tale of Satan is in the uppermost regions of the church. The smoke of Satan, he said, has entered the sanctuary. That was all the way back in 1977. We've certainly seen it now. What are the children of God doing? about it. What can we do about it? The first thing we must do and do every day is what the Queen of Prophets told us. Pray the rosary. Pray your rosary. 
Our Lady said there is no problem too difficult that cannot be overcome with the rosary. It looks like a weak thing, but doesn't God use the weakness of creation to show his mighty power? Why is it that of all the prayers in the world, this is the only prayer that is attacked? Why? Have you thought about it? People have the children of the world have no problem with the stations. They don't even have a problem with the mass. They have no problem with you saying psalms. They have no problem with you praying in the spirit. At the moment you take out the rosary, there's a problem. Why? We do not throw stones in trees that do not have fruit, do we? That's why it's attacked. And this is the weapon I recommend, I suggest, I encourage you to use in these dangerous times in which we live. Now, we do not just pray alone. It is better for us to pray together. Our prayer together must start in the family. And so there must be family rosaries. Because your children, your grandchildren, are the ones under attack. You are already adults. You have already paved your path. But the children come in are confused. You have to give them that strength of your faith that they can observe the law of God because they are being corrupted. It's already happening in the schools. And then there are the peer groups. Their friends are doing it. Seduction occurs. And before you know it, we would have joined the rest in our natural sin. God has promised that he will not destroy the world with water. But with what? Fire. Isn't that what he said? Fire. And, in, and on October the 13th, 1973, 50, 51 years ago. Our Lady appeared at Akita in Japan to a nun who was dead and said to her, if men go on offending God, the Father will send down such a punishment that has not been seen since the flood. Fire will fall from heaven and it will destroy the majority of the human race. The living will envy the dead. And then she said, listen to this, this was 50 years ago, 13th of October, 1973. She said, you will see cardinal against cardinal, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be despised and scorned by their confreres. Satan will lead many to leave the service of the Lord. In this last two months, December and January, we're now in February, we have seen something never seen before. Haven't we seen cardinal against cardinal? Haven't we seen bishops against bishops? And more, conferences of bishops against conferences of bishops. We saw it, we see it with our own eyes. Thank God for the Africans who have stood up. The whole continent of Africa said no to these blessings. But these people cannot be placated, they cannot be satisfied. And already they have undermined the bishops of South Africa. So now there is a, well, so already they are undermining. My brothers and sisters, we are living in dangerous times. Our lady said, fire will fall from heaven. 
Even as we speak, we see the tension in the Ukraine and Russia. We now see Israel and Gaza. Both of these have the potential for global war, a world war. They have the potential. If we continue to provoke God, we will see fire fall from heaven. Pray your rosary. St. Peter tells us, God was waiting patiently, and he still is, so that those who refuse to believe could change their minds and believe. Let us ask God for a good conscience that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has entered heaven and is at God's right hand, now that he has made the angels and dominations and powers his subjects, will have mercy on us. Pray, my brothers and sisters, for your priests, your deacons, your religious. Pray for our bishop. Pray for the college of bishops. And above all, pray for the poor. Remember what our Lord said to Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has got his wish to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, and when you have converted, when you have turned around, confirm your brethren. This is in the 22nd or 23rd chapter of St. Luke's Gospel. Satan has got his wish to sift us, and he is sifting us. Let us pray for our Pope. Let us ask our Blessed Lady, to whom we entrust all that we have and all that we are, to be our surety friends, for she is the Tower of David. She is the help of Christians, and she is our most merciful Queen and Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord to thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now that we are not. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.